Okay, g'day all and welcome to another video. So today what I wanted to do is uh, just have a little uh, chat about some, uh, some common misconceptions about assembly language. There's a lot of misconceptions about assembly language that are floating around in, uh, in programming communities. I just thought I might uh, make a little video describing some of the, uh, some of the most common ones that, uh, that I've come across. Misconception number one, assembly language is faster than high level languages. If you just port some code straight from C over to assembly language, it's probably not going to run faster. And uh, there's a really good chance that it will run not only slower, but a lot slower. The moment that you go into assembly language, the compiler just lets go of the reins completely. And it just says, all right, boss, it's all you. And just the overheads of having to call a function and that sort of thing will generally mean that unless you're doing a lot in assembly, unless you're staying in assembly language for, you know, billions of cycles or, or, or millions of cycles, the overheads for calling the function and jumping to assembly will be um, enough to make your assembly code not worth it. Yeah, your function will run slower. So if you jump over to assembly, then you really want to stay there for as long as possible. And once you're in assembly, if you want to outdo the compiler, then you've got to use all of the compiler's tricks and more. So the compiler knows how to unroll loops. It knows how to inline functions. Um, so you've got to do all of that stuff uh, if you hope to, uh, to gain performance over the compiler. Unroll your loops and uh, get rid of dependency chains, use multiple accumulators, uh, memory blocking, uh, SOA versus AOS. If you employ pretty much everything that you know about a computer and programming a CPU, then you can gain uh, extra speed, often, over a compiler, but you don't get that for free. Okay, so that's misconception number one. Assembly is faster than high-level languages. Usually it's not. Usually it's not. Uh, misconception number two. I might stop numbering these because I'll lose count. Assembly instructions execute in one clock cycle. No, no they don't. That's a misconception. Many assembly instructions do take one clock cycle to finish from, from the start to the, to the end. But that's not the whole story. So, so for one thing, that's only the simple instructions. Things like adding two integers or, or maybe some, some bitwise operation, your, your XORs and your AND and that sort of stuff. That one clock cycle is called the latency of the instruction from start to finish. And modern uh, CPUs are actually super scalar which is uh, very, very cool, very interesting uh, improvements in, in modern hardware. But, but what it means is that there's multiple execution units inside the CPU, and the CPU is actually capable of performing more than one instruction per cycle. Well, for example, you might have two instructions like INC RAX, INC RBX. So this is a, an, ins an assembly instruction just to, just to add one to, uh, to a register. But the CPU, or most CPUs nowadays, have more than one ALU, or arithmetic logic unit. So they might have, say, two, three, or four of them. And what that means is that uh, the CPU could actually execute four of these instructions at once. That's referred to as the throughput of an instruction. And if you want a whole bunch of uh, latency and throughput information, then you want to check out Agna Fogg's instruction tables. I'll put a link down below. So when you supply code, the CPU will actually look at a whole bunch of upcoming instructions and it will decide which ones it can execute uh, at the same time. Yeah, so, so sometimes it can't execute instructions at the same time. If you consider um, these two instructions here, we've got uh, INC RAX and then ADD RBX RAX. If you've got two instructions like this, this is called a dependency chain and they can't go through two different ports at the same time because the second instruction, that addition just there, relies on the result of the first instruction. The second instruction actually has to wait until the first instruction is completely finished and, uh, and retired before it can execute. In that case, then you'll get uh, your ink will execute in one clock cycle or whatever the latency of the instruction is. For, for ink REX, it will be one clock cycle. That's a fast instruction. So many of the instructions on average have a throughput that, that actually allows multiple, sort of two, three, or even four sometimes, four instructions to go through different ports at the same time. And this is not considering um, multi-core. This is just a single core that does this super scalar. Um, it's fascinating stuff, it's fascinating stuff. But not only that, there's a whole lot of instructions that take far, far longer than one clock cycle. So if you look at something like um, uh, div or idiv, 
the division instructions. Uh, division is notoriously difficult to, to execute. So the division instructions take anything from like 20 cycles to, to 70 or 80 cycles. Also got things like uh, square roots. The whole bunch of the x87 floating point unit instructions will be very, very slow. Uh, instructions that reference RAM or memory are often slower. Instructions with the lock prefix often slower. A whole bunch of instructions that execute much, much slower than one per clock cycle. And we've also got a whole bunch of uh, simple instructions that execute, you know, on average, much faster than one clock cycle. So the misconception that uh, assembly instructions execute one per clock cycle, uh, it's just not true. Okay, so the next misconception, assembly instructions are atomic. So first of all, I think we should define what atomic means. So this is to do with uh, multi-threaded parallel programming. Uh, let's say, for example, that you want to increment the variable a, so you just want to add 1 to it. Um, if it's got the value 5 in it or whatever, then you add 1 to it, it's going to have um, 6 in it. <laughs> atomic would mean that that add occurs in one uninterruptible step. If the ink instruction was atomic, you had two threads trying to add 1 to this a variable, then you would have one thread would add 1 to your 5 and you get 6, and then the other thread would also add 1 and you get 7 every time, if the instruction was atomic. So what actually happens when you want to update a variable, this is not considering um, caching and write-backs and that sort of thing, if we just, if we just consider uh, all of that stuff is a gimme, which is not, but <laughs> um, there's actually three steps to updating a value in RAM. We've got read, modify, and write. So if a thread comes along and it wants to increment our little a variable here, what it does first is it reads the value of a, which is a 5. It reads that into the CPU, into some, some temporary register somewhere. Then it updates the value, so it actually performs the inc, the increment. So if I add 1 to 5, you get 6. And then the final thing that it does is it writes the, uh, the result. So it'll write that 6 back to RAM. Uh, usually it would write it back to a cache or something, but without considering the way that uh, the caching hierarchy works. Um, yeah, it'll read the original value, then it'll modify that, performing whatever the operation is, ink in this instance, and then it'll write the result back to RAM. The thing is, those three steps don't happen at once. So if the ink instruction was atomic, then it would mean that when we have two threads that try and perform an ink on a variable, then both threads would successfully uh, increment the variable and write the correct result every time. Or you would end up adding two to your variable every time. But assembly instructions, ink, for example, is not inherently atomic. So what this means is that we end up with something called a race condition, which is where two threads race for the same resource. It's called a race condition and it's a parallel programming pitfall. But actually, it's just a whole can of worms. It's a lot of fun. Race conditions are brilliant. But the brilliancy of race conditions aside, this is what might end up happening. So let's say that we've just got ink A in two threads at once. Thread 1 reads variable A, and it reads 5. Thread 2 reads variable A, and it reads 5. So you can see already that because the instruction is not atomic, because it's broken into three different sections, um, something weird's going to happen. Um, then we might have the modify step. So thread 1 will modify its copy of the A variable, which is 5, so it'll increment that to 6. Likewise, at the same time, thread 2 will modify its copy, which was also 5, it's going to increment that to 6. And then finally, thread 1 will write 6 as the result back to RAM, and thread 2 will also write 6 as the result back to RAM. So what we'll get from uh, these two ink instructions executing, we'll actually only get the result of one of them executing. So this is a classic example of a race condition, and this is what happens when we've got read, modify, write, and our instructions are not atomic, as they're not in assembly. You might get the right result, but the problem is that uh, reading the code, you can't tell if you'll get the correct result or not. Um, there is a prefix, lock, uh, L-O-C-K, if you put the lock prefix before your instructions, so we say something like lock ink A, then it will be atomic. So the lock prefix causes an instruction to be executed atomically. So if both of these threads here were executing lock ink A, then it would mean that thread 1 would come along and say, you know, read the value of A, it'll modify the copy of A, and it'll save the result. 
and only once thread 1 has finished can thread 2 then come along and uh, read, modify, write the value of A itself. So lock will make your instructions atomic, and it's actually lock uh, prefix with comp exchange that's used to make uh, mutexes and semaphores and things like that. Inherently, the, uh, the instructions are not uh, atomic unless you add this lock prefix. And if you add that lock prefix, then the CPU will actually perform the instruction a lot slower. Yeah, you get, uh, you get a big performance hit for coordinating threads and using the lock prefix. Okay, so the next misconception, assembly language is only for hackers and virus authors and or it is a dangerous language. Um, you, can, you can make um, dangerous things in, in any language and there's, there's nothing really uh, inherently dangerous uh, about assembly language. Usually hacking would be achieved by sort of brute forcing ha uh, passwords and uh, hashing and things like that. So you wouldn't have to use assembly. I mean, you might, incidentally, since um, you, could, you could probably write a pretty fast hashing algorithm in assembly. But generally speaking, for a lot of the high level kind of internet hacking and things like that that you see, you, you'd really use a language that has something to do with that. I mean, you'd use HTML or PHP. Um, you're not going to use assembly language to hack someone's Facebook password, for example. I mean, you're just going to use um, a bunch of hashed passwords or something like that. Assembly language is not inherently dangerous. Now, you can do a lot of stupid things with assembly language, but you can do a lot of stupid things with any language. Uh, assembly language was, uh, a long time ago, used for, uh, for a lot of virus writing and hacking and things like that. Like your uh, CD cracks, no CD cracks and things like that. You'd have to have some knowledge of uh, assembly language in order to write something like that. But um, a lot of that is machine code. I mean, that's that's arguably even lower than, than assembly language. Uh, I'd say that assembly language is used for uh, performance, optimized performance programming. It's not really geared towards uh, hacking or virus writing any more than any other language is. Uh, don't write viruses if you can. If you can help yourself, try not to write a virus. Okay, the next misconception, assembly language is one language. Okay, so actually uh, all of the different hardwares out there have their own assembly language. So an assembly language is just the language of the hardware. So pretty much as many different uh, microcontrollers and CPUs as there exist, there is an assembly language for, for each of them. Often assembly language uh, refers to just x86 slash 64, that's um, modern Intel and AMD CPUs, uh, but that's just one assembly language. And uh, actually there's also ARM assembly languages, so your, your uh, mobile chips have their own assembly language. We've got uh, Atmel chips in the Arduinos and things like that. They've got their own assembly language. So in that sense, assembly language is a class or it's a family of, of languages. Often they'll share a few things in common, like they'll have uh, register files and they have a bunch of different instructions uh, in all of the assembly languages, but the languages themselves are, are you know, sometimes quite different from each other. But assembly language is not one language, it's really a family. Uh, or class of, of different languages. Okay, moving right along, the next misconception. This misconception is uh, a misconception all about um, assembly language. <laughs> assembly language is difficult. Yes, it is rather. So where's the misconception? Where's the misconception? All right, um, all programming is difficult. Um, every programming language is difficult. I would say, I would say uh, programming very good code, programming perfect code is not just NP hard, people, it's exponential. The difficulty in, uh, in assembly language is it's different to the difficulty of say C++. It's different, but assembly language is no more difficult. In C++ you've got a whole bunch of different mechanisms. So we've got things like classes and structures and if else blocks, we've got function calls and various forms of polymorphism. It's not easy to combine all of those mechanisms together into a useful uh, program. It's very, very difficult to program C++ well. So in assembly, we don't have things like classes and if else blocks. Uh, you can make those things if you want. But the, the difficulty of assembly is not in the number of different mechanisms. So there's only a handful of mechanisms. I mean, you've got uh, registers, addressing modes, instructions, a uh, bit about the caches, and, and that's pretty much it. That's all there is in assembly. The difficulty of assembly is the number of, uh, of instructions. Yeah, so there's, there's thousands, there's thousands and thousands of different instructions. 
uh, anything from you know adding things together to, uh, to to square roots of floating point numbers. We got Galois field instructions in there. Instructions that produce random numbers. Um, there's even instructions that help with say AES encryption and the um, hashing. What's the um, SHA? Yeah, SHA hashing. The difficulty of assembly is in learning uh, enough of those instructions that you can rely uh, reliably program something fast. So when you get used to assembly language and you've seen unrolled loops and you know what vector code looks like and all of that sort of stuff, it's not a whole lot more difficult to read um, you know, a 10 or 20 lines of assembly than it is to, to read and understand, say, 10 or 20 lines of C++. Tell me, if you, if you look at, a, if you look at a, a disassembly of some modern app and you're looking at 3 million lines of assembly, I mean, of course it's going to be difficult to understand. It's the same as if you look at 3 million lines of C++. You're not going to have a hope in hell of understanding it. Okay, and the final misconception, assembly language is no longer needed due to optimizing compilers. Okay, so we've sort of touched on this a little bit in uh, some of the previous misconceptions, but I do want to make a separate video on this exact topic, so we'll save most of it for another time. Uh, optimizing compilers are really, really excellent. I mean, they're excellent. Um, modern optimizing compilers are a thing of vast marvel. <laughs> Usually you wouldn't need to jump into assembly language. Uh, but assembly is actually used uh, everywhere. Uh, it's often just not very obvious where it's used. Most modern applications uh, use code programmed in assembly uh, at some point. Uh, assembly is it's a low level uh, language. It's, it's not obvious, you know, when you're coding away in, in, in Python or C++ or whatever. Uh, it's not obvious that you're employing uh, code that was written handwritten in assembly, but um, you often will be. Yeah, so assembly language is, uh, it's, it's, it's a low level uh, performance uh, language. So it's used for a lot of those foundation sorts of things. Your uh, maths routines for your BLAS libraries, your operating system routines and, and, and uh, things in the kernel, your image or, or, or video codecs. Uh, a lot of that sort of stuff is written in assembly. Because it's really, really important that we get that running as fast as possible. I mean, if you, if you think about something like, um, something like malloc in C++, the memory allocation routine, if that's not fast, if that's not fast, then the entire computer, the entire computer will run at like half the speed. So these low-level back-end things will, uh, will often feature uh, some or e even a lot of, of hand-coded assembly. Um, it's not obvious that uh, assembly is used everywhere, uh, all over the world, every day, but uh, it is. Uh, the final misconception, assembly language is no longer needed due to optimizing compilers. I mean, wh where do you think the optimizing compiler came from? I mean, seriously, what are you talking about? Um, assembly language is used all over the place. Uh, it's usually not obvious, though. This, this language is not separate from the CPU. The uh, assembly language is actually etched into the silicon. It's part of the CPU itself. On that note, I want to say thank you very much for watching and uh, I hope you have a really good day. Alright, have a good one.